Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest this week is Colonel Bruce Crandall. He's a U.S. Army veteran who earned the Medal of Honor for his actions as a helicopter pilot at the Battle of Ya Drang in Vietnam in 1965. In all, Colonel Crandall flew more than 900 missions in Vietnam and served 24 years in the Army. Colonel, we're very grateful for your time today. Let's start at the very beginning of your story. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Olympia, Washington. Uh, it was a great place to be raised. And, and when I was in my pre-teens, uh, the Second World War was on. and Everybody was uh, uh, doing their part for the war effort. And so it was a very patriotic community. Did that give you some indication that when you became old enough, you wanted to serve in the military? Well, my dad served. My uncles all served. I had one great uncle who lost both his sons at the beginning of the war. And he lived with us uh, uh, for, for, for the last part of the war. But uh, I don't know if that did it. or, or I joined a guard when I was 15 uh, because they had a basketball court. And, uh, and they, were, they were shooting artillery at, uh, at the targets in the air. And so, you know, this was all interesting to me. But, but the guard was a social organization as well as, as the military. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was a, an All-American baseball player, and I graduated from high school at 5'6 and 145 pounds. I was the smallest guy on the All-American team, and I was the cleanup hitter. <laughs> and uh, so I, in the Army, I thought I could play ball because there was a lot of great ball players in the Army in those days. Ted Williams was an was a aviator. And so I, uh, I thought I'd get to play ball in the military. And, uh, of course, I got stupid trying to throw a hand grenade far enough away so I, the noise didn't bother me. Uh, I tore the rotator cuff from my shoulder, and that, oh, no. that, that ended any baseball thoughts. Wow. So how old were you when you joined? Uh, I, I, I didn't join. I, I accepted a draft because I only, I only just served two years for the draft. And uh, so uh, I was uh, 19 when, uh, when I came in. Obviously something changed, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, it lasted a lot longer than two years. Yeah. Uh, so where did you go for, for basic training, and, and how did it progress from there? I went. They sent me 12 miles from home for basic that's pretty stupid. If you draft somebody, if I was a reluctant draftee, that was not the distance to do that. And I told everybody I was going in the Army and going to Korea because that's what everybody did. I went to Fort Lewis, and then they sent me to Fort Warden, Washington, which was 47 miles from home, and I was running boats, uh, M boats, and I was learning how to do assaults with a, from 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 like the Inchon invasion. I think that's what we were training for. Right. But uh, I had a first sergeant to call my buddy and I in and he said, we're too screwed up to to be in the Army and, and we might make corporal someday and he didn't want that on his conscience. But we'd make good second lieutenants and he had us sign the paperwork, get the hell out of his unit to go to OCS. <laughs> and, yeah, we went to leadership school and then OCS. And then what? Both of us got through. <laughs> Good. I figured that, given the rest of the story. But uh, yeah. where did you go from there? Uh, well, uh, I went to Engineer OCS at Belvoir here. Mm-hmm. And uh, as soon as I got through that, uh, they wanted all of us that graduated and were healthy to go to flight school. Because the Corps of Engineers had the two largest aviation outfits in the world. They had over 100 aviators uh, stationed in, out of San Francisco and then well over 100 out of Panama. And they were in mapping and topo all over the world. I flew in the Arctic, uh, float skis and wheels on the airplanes. I flew in the desert in Libya. Uh, all same, we had the same aircraft, the same equipment. Had Arctic sleeping bags, Arctic tents, uh, float skis and wheels for the aircraft. And, and uh, the Army was really showing how smart it was sending us over there to clear mines at the same time we're trying to map. There's three million live mines in the ground in Libya in 1956. We got 7,000 of them my first year. And then the Army decided we should have a mine report. We should fill out a form, 
and tell them how many mines we cleared. We suddenly couldn't find the form anymore. We didn't keep count. We didn't really give a rat's ass. The one thing we knew is that our little mine clearing wasn't going to have a hell of a lot of impact, and pretty quick they'd figure out maybe we ought to clear more. And uh, maybe mine clearing would become more important than mapping. And uh, mapping was the key. You had, if you didn't map that desert, they wouldn't have the oil getting out right now. And that's what we were doing. The oil companies followed us across the damn desert. So it, uh, they also had air-conditioned trailers for sleeping. They had uh, freezers. They had uh, frozen steaks. They had all the good stuff. And we're eating five and one rations and living in Arctic tents. Those guys didn't clear the minefields. We did. They followed us. At what point did you realize that this wasn't going to be a, a short-term part of your life, that it was going to be It, 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 it was in 1959. I got married in 56. In 59, I was at Fort Lewis, and I was getting ready to be assigned to South America. And I had to make a choice then. And that's basically when guys do that. They have a certain rank and a certain time frame in the family. And my wife was very uh, supportive. And she knew I loved to fly. And uh, if I got out, I would have gone with an airline. But I would have been a, a, a student pilot, more or less, for the airline. Uh, then you go as a co-pilot, and then you finally work your way up to captain. But uh, we made the decision, the two of us, we accepted the assignment to South America. And then I flew all over Central and South America for two years. Then I went to Costa Rica, and I was in Costa Rica for two and a half years. Our youngest son was born there. The only place outside the United States that that would let that happen. Great country, great place to live. Yeah, very, very much a democracy. At what point did you? This is obviously a few years later, but at what point did you get an inkling that you would probably end up going to Vietnam? Uh, that was in '65. I was down in the Dom Rep. For, people forget we went down there. We'd already trained as the Air Assault Division, at 11th Air Assault, and uh, while well, I was in the Dom Rep. Uh, one of the wives indicated to a, a, a sergeant, as she called him, an SOB over the radio, that uh, we were going to Vietnam. And we didn't get the word from the Pentagon until somewhat later. And uh, you know, we had to bring our aircraft home, bring our people home. Uh, I had uh, 12 days to get my family to Seattle and for me to get back, get my unit on a carrier going to, to Vietnam. They sent us commanders over by air so that we'd get the experience before troops got there of flying in country and working with uh, assaults the way they, they were doing them. What was your bird of choice? Hueys. We were flying uh, D models when we went to Vietnam, then we got H's, and the gun companies were C's. And uh, somebody who was not obviously an aviator decided that uh, the C-model gunship should be replaced by the Cobra. And uh, that was the dumbest move as far as an aviation unit would go. The Cobra has two people. One sits right behind the other. It's enclosed, so it's air-conditioned. That's very nice for the pilot. You can't hear people shooting at you. you the, the Huey, the pilots are alongside each other. One's got the left front, one's got the right front. There's a door gunner and a crew chief back there. Then they got M60s, and they pick up most of the ground fire because people don't shoot at the front of a gunship. Not smart people don't. Living people don't either. Cause <laughs> if you shoot at the front of me, I got many guns and rockets, and we can raise all sorts of hell. I got a cannon and a, and a C-model Huey. 
But uh, the, the Cobra has all those, but they've only got the two pilots like this. So they could fly over the same point of ground three or four times and be being fired on every time and not know it until they're hit. Now, I prefer to know it. And having those two guys in the back and the pilots up front to look just made re really good sense. But somebody sold us on the Cobra. That was a bad buy, bad buy. Of course, we got now the Marines have something that tilts, and, and it's supposed to be a great aircraft. It's over in Afghanistan. Have you ever heard of them doing anything at all in Afghanistan? Uh, the the bird that was the most effective in Vietnam besides the Huey on assault was the next bigger bird that, that could carry in the cargo and stuff. And, and, the, and that is the bird that's doing all the work in, in Afghanistan. It's uh, the Chinook. And it, it can work high levels and it can do the things that need to be done. Uh, it's a bird in, in at Fort Lewis, for example, that can go up on Mount Rainier to do rescue work. Much more with Medal of Honor recipient Bruce Crandall in just a moment on Veterans Chronicles. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks for being with us. I'm joined today by retired U.S. Army Colonel Bruce Crandall. He's a Medal of Honor recipient for his actions rescuing dozens of injured Americans during the Battle of Ya Drang in Vietnam in November 1965. We're now to the Vietnam part of your story, sir. What were you told would be your primary mission on that tour? Well, we, we, we knew the air mobility by then. We'd had a couple of years of training in the Carolinas and at Fort Benning. So we knew the concept. And, uh, and of course, you have to develop it further if, once you start getting shot at. It's a, it becomes a different ball game. Not that different, but enough so that you... You better learn as you go along. When we first arrived in country, we spent a lot of time doing, building a base camp that was wasted effort. Uh, my, my crew chiefs and, and, and my uh, clerks and my cooks all had to be cutting brush and clearing the area. Uh, and, the, and we'd go out on assault supporting the infantry unit and we'd have to take those people with us because we didn't have door gunners yet. Hmm. I was short 20 people. I had 20 helicopters, one Jeep, and uh, they didn't give me the door gunners to, to take with me to Vietnam. So I have to get door gunners, and that means that my cooks and clerks and majors from the staff were all f flying that door gunner slot. And until I finally got people assigned. And uh, by the time I was getting people assigned, our division went over as a division. We came home as individuals. Now, what that did was I had to lose half of my unit by the time we had been there six months. I had to send them to other units, and I would get people in from them. And by the time the year was up, I would be the only one left, and that was the way it was. Uh, there was no division back in the state. All of us had been sent back there, but we went to Panama. We went, the engineers went to, to, to overseas, uh, to topo units that were mapping. Or they'd go to up, uh, ground jobs in the Corps of Engineers. But there was no division. There was no assets. No one had any control over where the hell we were. So we couldn't be brought back together. It was an impossible task. So it was st stupid. We don't do that anymore. We don't send a unit and break them up over there. We send them and we bring them back home. Because then you still have a unit. And you replace them with a unit. But in the CAV, they didn't do that. And so we ended up with inexperienced people in the CAV division leading in, in those positions. And uh, they weren't that effective for the next couple of years. 
and they finally uh, rotated the whole thing out of there. But those are kind of dumb things that if I was to write a book, it, that would be part of it. Don't don't send a unit and bring it home individually because it kills the commander. It. I had to take guys that had been in my unit two and a half years that I loved. I knew their wives. I knew their kids. I knew them. And I had to send them away from me to other units to get their trash. And I'd have done it to them if I'd had that chance. You know, uh, you if you're a commander and you've got a drunk warrant officer that's a problem, send him to me. Because you're going to get somebody better than that as a replacement. And that's that's tough duty. You should never send units like that and come bring them home because you're hurting the the unit, you're hurting the command structure, you're hurting the future, and anyone who can't figure that out has never been in a, in that situation because it looks okay. Right, looks good on paper. My unit when it, when it went over looked good on paper because somebody in the Pentagon required us to have a designation that was already on the rolls of, of, of approved units in the military. So any unit that had a 2-2 on it, a 226, 227, 228, 229, those were all brand new units. So my battalion was the 229th. I'm A Company, the 229th. I have the most command time of anybody. I've led 756 combat missions in the lead helicopter. I had had that unit for two years off and on, in the Carolinas or in the Dalmarip or back in the States. So I, I was the most experienced le leader in the Army at the time. I couldn't command my battalion. I couldn't move up because it, it, was, a, it was a combat units only could command it. Plus, I had two designations when I went over because I wasn't a, a regular Army unit. My, my unit was A Company, the 7th Special Forces, 1st Special Forces Group, and A Company, the 2 tonight. I get somebody wounded, I've got to look for them under those two designations because I don't know how in the hell they got medevaced out. Whether they were medevaced out as 2 2 9th, A Company, or whether they were Aviation Company, 7th Special Force. So those those are stupid things that should have been handled in the Pentagon. We shouldn't have been burdened with that kind of nonsense. That's, yeah. But that's what happened. And if I write a book, it's going to be called Dad's. That's an acronym for dumbass decisions that I didn't make. Sir, we are going to take one more break here, much more with Medal of Honor recipient Bruce Crandall when we come back on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. I'm honored to be joined today by retired U.S. Army Colonel Bruce Crandall, a Huey helicopter pilot who received the Medal of Honor for his actions evacuating dozens of American soldiers while under fire in late 1965. And sir, let's talk about what was happening that day at the time of those actions. This is the Battle of Yadrang, still fairly early in the major combat operations in Vietnam. Tell us your story as you found out there were significant American casualties there. I was the uh, commander of the aviation support for that battle. And uh, we, we were uh, planning on lifting that unit. It was the 1st or 7th. And, and then I'd lift two other battalions, put them on a blocking positions on the uh, uh, a Cambodian border to keep uh, uh, the uh, people that had been assaulting our... Uh, in-country uh, special forces camps. We were trying to keep them from getting out of the country. We wanted to wipe them up before they could get out of the country and come back and do it again. Anyhow, the the, the fighting was planned to the east, and uh, they ended up, the major fighting went to the west. It was coming off the mountain, and uh, we, there was, we lost, I think, 301 dead total in, the, in the, those few days that this went on. It wasn't just an x-ray, it was the whole thing. And that was the most casualties that any unit had lost 
since the she- uh, Korean War, I think. Uh, Port Chop Hill, I think, lost more. But uh, we we set the, sh- the high standard for battlefield casualties uh, in in Vietnam by by that date. And uh, we learned a lot of lessons uh, in in that battle. Uh, some of them were still relearning. We got to trust the the resources that, and the people that are in the field. Trust them to do the job. Turn them loose. If uh, if you get attacked from the from your right, you can sh- shoot back to the right. You don't care where it's from. Uh, and we still have a little problem with allowing that kind of freedom, but we have to allow it because what happened in X-ray was that those people came off the supposedly out of Cambodia, and came down on them and just beat the hell out of those two units. The second of the seventh lost more people than it did in, when Custer uh, hit them, and uh, the first or seventh uh, was was the first ones in that. In the battle, they were the ones I carried in into X-ray. But the second of the seventh went cross country on the 16th from X-ray to, to Albany to come back to, to, to secure the landing zone after after the B-52 strike. And uh, at the time that the second of the seventh arrived in Albany, a B-52 strike hit X-ray. And then we were going to have the second or the seventh and the first or fifth come back and clean up the battlefield. Well, as it is, the second or the seventh got wiped out. I think they lost 155 dead and 125 wounded. And uh, that did it. Uh, that triggered everybody to get the hell out of that area. We can't afford to do that any further. Uh, we've got to figure out another way of doing this because you can't lose that many people and uh, and the division commander uh, brought us back to re, re reorganize and get get ready to do it in a different manner so uh, we uh, we ended up uh, lessons learned that uh, you gotta you gotta let them go because if we'd have been turned loose to hit those people coming down off that hill we could reach them with the artillery the artillery that was firing on, on X-ray could reach those people, and we could hit them with bombers. We could hit them with everything, if the argument over whether it was in country or not was settled. And the argument was settled as far as it, our division was concerned. Is they were not in Vietnam, they were in Cambodia. I'm a mapper. I've been doing it for ten years before I went to Vietnam. You can't tell me where that border is. That's jungle. There is nothing up there that gives you a landmark of any sort. The top of the mountain might, you could you could say, okay, the top of that mountain, this side is in Vietnam, that side in Cambodia. But to say that in that jungle, you can tell where it is. Just no, you can't. And that's where you have a lot of arguments between Brazil and and uh, Venezuela, between Venezuela and French Guiana, between Venezuela and Colombia. Venezuela shares a lot of border and jungle, and uh, they have a lot of disagreements with their border countries because you have a hard time telling where that border is. And if you, let's say it's a river, river changes its banks. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, the arguments are valid. I'm, I'm not saying that Venezuela is wrong. Brazil is right. Nobody knows. You, you just don't know where that damn border was when they first established it. Sir, when those casualties uh, came yeah. down, there were, I, I believe, initial efforts to, to medevac the wounded out, but eventually there were orders that came down that said the fire's too hot. Uh, medevac didn't do any medevac. Their, their commander... Was, Gave them a directive; they would not do medevacking in an LZ that was hot, and an LZ that is red. A green landing zone was one that, for five minutes, there was no fire. They didn't get that. I led two of their birds in, and uh, it offended that commander quite highly. 
he looked me up that night and uh, jerked me off a cot and threatened me. And I thought he was an enemy, and I came up with a pistol on him. I put it in a movie, but they showed it uh, when I got out of the helicopter. But he he came after me for leading his people into a hot landing zone. And he should never have been in command. If he just told his guys, do what you what you think is right, they'd done what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And we'd have been twice as much medevacking or half the time in, taken up in medevac. In my, we've, if I finally took all the seats out of my helicopter that were in the cargo bay because I, I couldn't do medevac. And have a, I couldn't lay them in there with the seats in there. Mm -hmm. And the general says, why'd you do that? And I said, you don't think the infantry's sitting in those seats when we're going on an attack anyhow, do you? They're not seat belted in and sitting there like they're back in the States. They're in the doors, and they got their feet on the skids, and when we level off, they're gone. I don't have to tell them to get off. And I'm not going to sit on the ground and wait for them to take their seat belts off and, and just check around their seats to see if they've left anything. If I'm getting shot at, I want them off. So we have an agreement. They can sit in the doors of my helicopter all day long, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the wounded out on the deck. And not too long ago, it required a, a general officer's signature to take a seat out of the helicopter. Talk about that a, a little more. You went back into a hot zone time after time after time. You and... and I'm my wingman, Ed Freeman. Both right. got the medal. That's right. Talk about how you communicated with each other, how you decided that this, this had to be done. There was no other choice. When the fifth lift in, I had six people shot off my aircraft. Three killed and three wounded. My crew chief shot through the throat. Uh, the, the radio operator for the infantry company was killed. Uh, anyhow, I, on the way back in, I knew that that LZ had really gone to hell because there were people shooting at me from just outside of my aircraft, it seemed like. They were just close as the trees, and I was pretty damn close to the trees because it was only an eight-ship LZ at the time. We later enlarged it to 20 some. But uh, I had to land pretty close to the trees. And these guys are shooting people off my aircraft with head hits. So they pretty accurate shooting. Anyhow, the, 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 uh, on the way back in, I, I, I called ahead and I said, I wanted all my commanders, each aircraft commander, at my aircraft when I hit the ground. And I canceled the second eight aircraft and sent them back. And uh, when we arrived back, I, I, mean, I sent two helicopters back to to play me because, uh, no, play coup. To play me didn't have any more ammo. I'd already taken it all. So we had to go back to play coup to get ammo to, to carry in. And I figured two helicopters was all I was going to need. Well, of course, that was way to hell short. And when I got back, I, the commanders came forward and I asked for volunteers to go with me. I said, I want someone to fly my cover. So there's two birds are going to be up there instead of one. Because if something happens, you need to know where it happened at. And if a guy goes down in the jungle, you want to be able to get him out of there as fast as possible. And another helicopter can provide suppressive fire and do all the things that you need. Anyhow, uh, Ed Freeman volunteered. Now, Ed had been my boss in Panama, and uh, he uh, uh, wanted to do the mission. He, he didn't want me to go. He says, no, you stay. I'll take it. I says, uh, no, I'm the commander. I'm going to go. I'm going to find out what the hell's going on in there. And uh, he says, well, you should stay here. And I says, look, you're no longer my boss, Ed. I'm in the commander here, because he'd been my boss in Panama. He didn't get promoted, and I did. And uh, he didn't have to serve for me. We had a great relationship. We, nobody in my outfit ever knew that he had been my boss at one time or that he had been passed over for promotion. But he volunteered to serve. So he finally got the picture that I'm going to lead it. And he says, I'm going in. And I shouldn't have taken him because... He was a senior guy back 
with the rest of them. So I met, took my third in command. Is going to take charge. Hell, he was a major. I didn't have any problem with that? So Ed, Ed was only a captain. He was my first platoon commander, and Ed Wall, Ed, uh, Jim Wall was uh, my second platoon commander. Anyhow, we t we get airborne, and I give a call to Moore when I'm out there a couple, couple of miles. And I, I, I'm i listening on his radios all this time. I know what the hell's going on. I hear his people yelling, I'm out of ammo, I need ammo, and uh, I need more infantry, I need support, and, and I can't do anything. I'm not going to bring troops in there when, when they're shooting at it. I, uh, out of the eight aircraft that I started with, I, I had four that were still flyable, and I was flying them if they were shot up. They were just shot up bad enough so they were leaking fuel or they were uh, binding controls or something that kept me from flying them again. If they didn't have that leaking fuel or binding controls, duct tape so we'd know where the new holes were. And we'd fly them. I flew the same aircraft uh, three times, I think, that day. Uh, the first aircraft I flew, I flew twice. And I ended up with 22 flights on it. And I'd, I had logged in on that bird in the morning. So my name was in the book. And I think that's how they find out how many flights I made. Mm. But we made a lot more than that. It was only five miles. It, that's, that's two and a half minutes in a Huey going 120. Mm. So you're talking seven minutes round trip, eight minutes, depending on how long you take on in the landing zone. So you're not, you're not spending a whole lot of time. And we we ended up uh, uh, getting seventy some people lived out of the people we medevac, and I think we'd have had a hell of a lot more than that if we'd had the medevac unit doing it too. And my second tour, we we took care of that medevac policy. They no longer had a green landing zone requirement. We we got a commander down there that. Let his people do what they they should be doing. Mm -hmm. it, that's a shame that you find out in combat what what can go wrong in combat. Right. That, that's pretty late to be finding it out, and you can't train for it and find it out. Uh, I don't care what you do down in a training base; it's not the same thing. And we shouldn't be making this. It's just as tough on the troops as we can in the training. Because you don't get anything from that. You wear them out. You take them away from being interested in the military. But what do you gain? Just from busting their butts, uh, and working them all night and all day and, and, and in the jungle uh, training or in desert training, whatever. You don't gain that much. You should train in the desert. You should train in the jungle. But train for that facility, that type of uh, setup, but don't make it just as tough on the troops as you can make it, and that's what we do. We, uh, we teach the troops that hardship, they got no hardship nonsense. Teach them how to scrounge electrical equipment, generators, teach them how to, to know where the Air Force supply depots are, get, get equipment that that they can use in a, when they get there. They should have told us what, what where we were going. Because chainsaws would have been my... I'd have bought chainsaws and electric generators and Home Depot. I'd have spent $10,000 of my own money if I had known. Because I, I would have sold that stuff to get my money back, and then I would still have a lot of it left over because that's what we needed and we didn't have it. We weren't allowed to take chainsaws into, <laughs> into the base camp and cut down all those trees. We had to do that by Hatchet. axes and uh, machetes. The machete was the biggest tool we had uh, at my level. That's the wrong way to do business. It, uh, Teach the troops how to live right. 
Well, you showed them how to live right, and uh, your heroism was rewarded. Whatever they many, mean. Many years later, but rewarded nonetheless. Yeah. That's a better way to do it. It's, it's the same as we got some commanders that think killing the enemy soldiers is the key. That's nonsense. Body count shouldn't even be, it shouldn't even be considered anymore because you're doing body count for whom? Somebody in the Pentagon wants a body count. Somebody on the upper level. That, that's, that proves we're doing something. That proves we're being effective. Back crap. When we went into Afghanistan, into uh, Iraq, we had all those Iraqi soldiers and tanks and our equipment lined up on the road, and we just wiped them out. And what did we gain from it? Probably a million Arabs hated us more because it was shown on their TV as well as ours. For what purpose? All we had to do was haul ass and bypass them. And then they would have still been there. Soldiers in the military are not people that you need to kill. It's Saddam that you need to kill. It's people like that. But you don't have to be killing everybody that you're facing. You need those people to take over when you get in, in command of it. And when you take charge in the country, you need those soldiers to be your security forces and stuff. We did it in Germany. Uh, George C. Marshall, General Marshall, said they're no longer our enemy. The Italians are no longer our enemy. They are, we're going to build the economies. We're going to build Europe back up. And he took and did that. And that's what you have to do. We have to plan to convert them. Don't kill them. And killing them is just makes... You kill my kids, I'm going to be pissed at you. Colonel Crandall, it's been an honor to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your time and for your service. Uh, Colonel Bruce Crandall served 24 years in the U.S. Army. He's a veteran of the Vietnam War and received the Medal of Honor for his actions as a helicopter pilot evacuating scores of wounded Americans in November 1965. Thank you for listening to Veterans Chronicles. It's a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter. We're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Greg Columbus. Thanks so much for listening, and please join us again next time on Veterans Chronicles. Yeah.